Good. Uh, Dr. Glenn is an internationally recognized thought leader known as the disaster avoidance expert. Dr. Gleb is on a mission to protect people from the dangerous judgment errors known as cogn cog cognitive biases. He does so by using a combination of his pragmatic business experience and cutting edge neuroscience and behavioral economic research to develop the most effective strategies for making decisions, managing risk and avoiding disasters, which of course is very important to our group. A best-selling author of several traditional published books, Dr. Gleb is best known for his Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering to Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, published by Career Press. His newest book, published by Changemakers Books, is Resilience, Adopt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. His groundbreaking thought leadership was featured in over 550 articles and 450 interviews in prominent venues. These include Time Incorporated Magazine, CBS News, Business Insider, The Chronicle of Philosophy, and CNBC and Fast Company. Dr. Glove's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, speaking, and training experience as CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts. His clients include innovative startups, large nonprofits, and Fortune 500 companies such as Aflac, Honda, Wells Fargo, and the World Wildlife Fund, and Xerox. His expertise also comes from his research background as a cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist. He spent over 15 years in higher education, including seven as a professor at Ohio State University. Oh, bucks. <laughs> I'm not done yet. He published dozens of peer-reviewed articles in academic journals, such as Behavior and Social Issues and Journal of Social and Political Psychology. He lives and travels from Columbus, Ohio. In his free time, he enjoys tennis, hiking, and most importantly, makes sure to spend abundant quality time with his wife to avoid disasters in his personal life, which is true. To help you take advantage of this expertise, I've asked him to share this with you. All right, back to you. All right. Well, welcome everyone. And let's talk about an issue that's not so fun, but really important for project managers. How do you as project managers adapt to the reality of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic to survive and thrive in the pandemic and help your companies do so and your careers do so, as well as recover in the post-pandemic recovery? So that's what we'll be focusing on today. That's the topic. And I want to start our presentation so with talking about Elon Musk. Now, Elon Musk, of course, is very famous, one of the most prominent entrepreneurs, the founder of SpaceX, Tesla, and so on. And of course, in those companies, he has a lot of project managers working for him. Well, on March 6, as the coronavirus pandemic was taking root here in the United States, he rooted that the coronavirus pan he tweeted that the coronavirus panic is dumb and he has a very, very big following, perhaps the biggest among new entrepreneurs in terms of Twitter followers. So that got 1.7 million likes. Then just a couple of weeks later, after the declaration of the national emergency here in the on the coronavirus pandemic here in the US, he tweeted on March 19th, so three days after that, that based on current trends, probably close to zero new cases in the US by the end of April. Well, guess what? We're over 3 million, nearly 4 million cases, and we have over 140,000 people dead. So he is very wrong. So we have new entrepreneurs who are wrong, but he's not the only one. We look at old money, you know, the who's the comparison, you know, the Ford, the General Motors to the to Tesla and SpaceX, Goldman Sachs, financial analysts, really old money. And they have a lot of people listening to them, like the leaders of Ford and, you know, and the General Motors and a lot of older companies. And Goldman Sachs said it estimated you. One of the things it does that's very prominent, very well known is estimates US GDP growth per quarter. So February 24th, they made an estimate of the second quarter growth of US GDP, and it was 2.7%. So that's their estimate. Now, in just a couple of weeks later, on March 15th, they changed their estimate, changed their estimate from 2.7% growth to 5% decline. 
that's a 7.7% difference. It's a huge difference, major, major difference. Clearly, they screwed up the first time, their first estimate, and they underestimated the impact of the pandemic. But look what happened later. Just five days later, they made another estimate, another revision of their estimate to a 24% decline. So clearly, five days 20, from 5% to 24%, something went very wrong. And now we know that the recent numbers came out on the US GDP for the second quarter, it was actually a 34% decline. So they were off on their worst estimates. So we know that a lot of people, whether new entrepreneurs and people listening to them, <clears throat> like Elon Musk or old money, who Goldman Sachs, people who listen to them, General Motors and so on, those companies, they were wrong and they were unprepared. They were really unprepared for the pandemic. They underestimated the threat and they turned to their emergency business continuity plans. Now, as a disaster avoidance expert, I make a lot of these business continuity plans. And I can tell you, they're not a good fit, fit for the pandemic. That's not what they're for. That They're a good fit for emergencies when you're dealing with an emergency, a short-term brief interruption, like let's say a blizzard. You know, Michigan has a lot of blizzards. Or when Houston got flooded, it's major flooding. You know, it's a one to two week interruption. But this is not that. COVID-19 is not an emergency. It's like Houston got flooded and stayed flooded. It's a major disruptor. It's slow moving, high impact, and a long term disruptor. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And the typical business continuity plans are made for a sprint. They're not made for a marathon. So people relying on them ran into serious problems. Vaccines are going to be the only way we get out of COVID-19. We know we have a couple of treatments available that decrease somewhat the death rate, remdesivir, you know, some new treatments that decrease the death rate, but they only decrease the death rate by a few percentage points, you know, 10%, 20%. It's not that much of a decrease. So from 0.5% maybe to 0.45%, something like that. Not that much of a decrease. A vaccine is the only effective solution. And human trials for vaccine, they need we need to test the safety of the vaccine and the effectiveness. You know, if we throw all the money at it, which we are, and cut all the red tape, which we are, they will take at least a year, as opposed to the usual four to five years when we don't throw all the money at it and cut the red tape. Now, important to note that most vaccines don't make it for human trials. And it's unlikely that the first trials of vaccines will be successful. You've probably heard about Moderna and various other Johnson & Johnson vaccines that are entering human trials. Well, those trials are unfortunately, based on historical precedent, unlikely to be successful, especially with something rushed into production. We know, for example, that a new strain of COVID-19 has developed recently that seems to be much more infectious than the first strain. And we don't, and the vaccines were created to deal with the original strain. That's what they're for. We don't know whether they'll be effective for the new strain or not. So that's a serious problem. And that is one of the problems that comes when you rush a vaccine into production. Then after a vaccine is ready, the government needs to create the production, distribution, and vaccination of people. So that is another serious problem because the government has not shown a high level of competency, you know, the federal level, especially some of the state levels, local levels, but the production, distribution, vaccination, that would really need to be federal led. And the federal government with the per personal protective equipment, with lack of testing, lack of ventilators has not shown great competence, unfortunately, in leadership in terms of a national vaccine, in terms of a national approach, federal level approach to addressing COVID-19. And I'm not very confident that it will show the same ability to deal with the vaccine either. So talk about possible timelines for how we get out of COVID-19, optimistic, moderate, and pessimistic. Optimistic assumes that we get really lucky. It's approved for mass production by summer of 2021. That means one of the first waves is successful, whether the Moderna, the Johnson & Johnson, or one of the other ones, the University of Cambridge vaccine, then production distribution vaccination, we're assuming a superb level of government competence, really very, very much a war-like effort, you know, real war mentality driving to you know, the same thing that we did in World War II, very thorough mobilization. It will only take six months to produce, distribute, and vaccinate people. And remember, vaccination is going to be difficult because 
we have surveys indicating that only about 50% of the population is ready to take a vaccine. So there needs to be education about vaccination as part of the vaccination to get people vaccinated, because we need something like 80% of the population to be immune to COVID-19 in order to have herd immunity. And we'll have most people vaccinated by early 2022. That's the really optimistic scenario. Now that assumes we have a vaccine that's nearly 100% effective and long lasting. Right now, we see initial studies showing that our immunity to COVID-19 fades pretty quickly within as, as short as two months if somebody didn't have strong symptoms to, for COVID-19. So in the research currently indicates this scenario is very unlikely. So it's very optimistic. I'd say the probability is 25% for this one. Moderate scenario. So let's talk about the moderate scenario. What can realistically happen? This is the realistic scenario. It's going to be approved for mass production sometime between 2022, maybe late 2021 to something like late 2025. So a four year period with a midpoint of 2023. Then production distribution vaccination at a moderate level of government competence, somewhat higher than we've seen the federal government first responding to COVID-19 will be take about a year. And then most people will be vaccinated by 2024 with an effective vaccine that really cre creates long-term immunity. That's a 50% chance scenario. So unfortunately, we can also be in a world where we're unlucky, not simply realistic, but pessimistic. So this is a pessimistic scenario. It'll be approved for mass production by 2026, a safe, effective, long-term lasting vaccine, not a medium-term vaccine that gets someone to have only a couple of months of immunity because really we won't have enough vaccine to get everyone through the cycle of immunity with booster shots. Then production distribution vaccination will take a year. And then most people will be vaccinated with a safe, effective, vaccine by 2027. And you might think this, you know, 25% is too cynical. This is the this is the pessimistic scenario. But really, we don't even have a good effective vaccine for the flu. And we've been trying to get that for over a century. Our current vaccine for the flu is only 50% effective. And of course, COVID-19 is a coronavirus like the flu virus. So this is a something that might well happen. And it's pessimistic, but 25% of the worlds have this be our future. So these are the possible timelines. Now, within this context, I have to say this is not easy to hear. I'm sure this is not easy to hear for you. This is not easy for me to share. When I was researching this topic, I really struggled with this information. It was really hard for me to accept. And it's really hard for my clients to accept this painful information. You know, and it's not easy for them to hear. It's not easy for them to deal with, I, I have to say. But I've the way I get them across the hump and me internally, the way I got myself across the, you know, across the hump was just saying and realizing that the sooner we accept this painful and comfortable information, the sooner we can deal with it effectively. So what are we facing? Our future until widespread vaccination will be what we're seeing right now. We see loosened restrictions in a number of states, and that's what happened, and then increase in cases. Now we're seeing in a few states that had really bad situations, Texas, Arizona, Florida, Louisiana, California, tightened restrictions, and then a decrease in cases. So that's what we're going to see in the next few years until we have a safe, effective vaccine available. Waves, repeating waves of loose restrictions increase, tighter restrictions decrease. And so we'll have to deal with various levels of social distancing and repeating shutdowns, restrictions, until a vaccine is widely available. So this is not a short-term emergency. We have to realize that. It's a major disruption. And this is something that in the most optimistic scenario will still be around until 2022. And that's the most optimistic scenario. The world will change forever, even in the most optimistic scenario. Waves of restrictions, they'll change how we behave. We'll change our habits, values, norms, desires. We'll never go back to January 2020, that idyllic age. Your role as a trusted advisor. So as a trusted advisor, your role is to empower the top level leadership to realize the extent of this major disruption. Most leaders tend to be way too optimistic. It's, it's in their nature. It's in their personality. And it's understandable that they are optimistic. They hold a vision of the bright future. 
you need to help as a project manager help hold their feet to the ground and real help them realize that hey the situation is really much worse than it feels internally we need to help them prepare for the uncomfortable reality and so by doing that you'll help them achieve their leadership goals by getting their buy-in and getting their acceptance and then having them take the wise steps that will lead to the outcomes they desire and you can build their trust in you as a trusted advisor so it's good for your long-term relationship to leaders so i want to stress and highlight that you shouldn't plan for the optimistic scenario there are too many companies they act as though the problem will blow over soon maybe you know by the end of the summer by the end of the year that it'll blow over so you know treating it as a day-to-day -day issue in their strategic planning not really thinking about the long-term impact for them of COVID 19. but hope is not a strategy which is a great phrase attributed to vince lombardi you want to prepare for the moderate or ideally the pessimistic scenario for the future the pandemic is a slow moving threat you have to realize that that's what you're dealing with a slow moving threat and we make very bad decisions as human beings about such slow moving threats ones that are unusual ones that are slow moving ones that are problematic in that regard slow moving train wrecks because of how our brain is wired. We're not wired to have good thought patterns about slow moving train wrecks. Our gut reaction is to really underestimate such threats. And that's a big problem for us because of our evolutionary wiring and the structure of our brain. It leads to decisions that really damage our businesses. And that's my area of expertise. I, I look at the cognitive neuroscience, I look at the cognitive angle. How do we think about our decisions? How do we think about projects we manage, how do we make good strategic plans and help leaders make better strategic plans going forward. So let me talk a little bit about my expertise and my experience, clients, media. My experience, so I've spent as CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts and elsewhere, I this is a boutique consulting, coaching and training firm and I've been doing consulting, coaching and training of various sorts in disaster avoidance, risk management, decision making and strategic planning for over 20 years. I've also spent 15 years in academia researching these very topics, including seven years as a professor in Ohio State University, and I published in a variety of peer-reviewed journals such as Behavior and Social Issues, Journal of Social and Political Psychology, and so on. My clients, my clients are really diverse. They span from innovative startups to Fortune 500 companies, from Aflac to Xerox. I work more with middle market and larger companies like Aflac and Xerox. Media, I've been on prominent media of all sorts, Inc, Fast Company, Scientific American, CBS News, Time, CNBC, NPR, Newsweek, you name it. And I published four best-selling books, ones that I'm known for. My best, so my most prominent book, the one sold the best, I'm best known for, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneer Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, about decision-making and strategic planning. That is published by Career Press. The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. Talks about communication, unconscious bias, how to address these issues, teamwork. That's what that's about, stakeholder engagement. The Truth Seekers Handbook, a science-based guide. How to figure out the truth, even uncomfortable truth about COVID-19, and how to help others realize it. And finally, my newest book, which has already become a bestseller, published with Changemakers Books, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. That's about how to strategically manage projects, do strategic planning, make decisions in the context of COVID-19. So that's a little bit about me. Let's talk a little bit about our decision making and why bad advice is common, such as from Goldman Sachs, from Elon Musk, and so on. We face a lot of dangerous judgment errors in our thinking. And these dangerous judgment errors are known as cognitive biases. They come from a combination of our evolutionary background and how our brains are wired. So that's where cognitive biases come from. The primary thing that we need to think about in terms of COVID-19 is how we respond to threats, how we respond to external threats. The fight or flight response is our primary response to threats. That's our gut reaction. That's what we feel is right. It was great for our, the hunter gatherers. That's what our brain is wired for. Our brain is wired for that savanna environment. When we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people or of hunter gathering. So the fight or flight response, you know, had to jump at 100 shadows to get away from that one saber tooth tiger because the risks that we faced weren't immediate and tense. The saber tooth tigers, right? That's what we faced back then. 
But that's not the risks we face right now. It's dangerous in today's world to respond with our gut reactions, how we feel intuitively to the kind of threats we face, which are much more ambiguous, long-term, uncertain. It can come as a notification on your smartphone about an article someone forwarded you about a disease that rose up in the middle of China. So that is, you know, Wuhan, China, right? Who knows what that is? Well, you know, I know it's a city of 11 million people. It's over 24 billion in revenue per year and has uh, something like 500 international flights a day. So assuming around 200 people per flight, that's 10,000 people a day traveling internationally. Of course, it's going to get out. Of course, it's going to go broadly. In fact, Italy was the for Northern Italy was the first place that COVID-19 hit outside of Asia because it specifically has a lot of ties to Wuhan in its uh, clothes making industry. So that, of course, it has a strong tie. And that is something that's going to get out of Wuhan. And people who researched this topic knew about it. I was already warning about this in op-eds way back early in the pandemic. But unfortunately, people don't pay attention to this. They don't feel that the, this thing can happen to them because of a number of cognitive biases that we deal with that we have to address. Normalcy bias, planning fallacy, and hyperbolic discounting. Now, normalcy bias. We tend to assume that everything will keep going normally. And that's because in the Savannah environment, that was a safe assumption. You know, the main change in the future was a change of the seasons, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall. That's how things would go. So it was bad to think that we would have significant change in the future. But that's not what our life is like right now. Think about yourself five years from now you probably think about yourself five years from now as a wiser slightly older version of yourself and that's what it feels like that's who you'll be well think about yourself five years back you'll probably realize that there were very many changes in you from the person you are right now the, you've changed in a number of ways in the last five years, you know, <laughs> saying that people don't change is a very fallacious mode of thinking. We change. We really change a lot over time. And that doesn't feel intuitive to us because when you're thinking about ourselves from five years from now, you should need to realize that you'll probably change as much or if not more than you changed in the last five years from the person you were five years ago, but it doesn't feel like that. So this is called the normalcy bias, where we forecast the short-term future in the next few, several years based on the short-term past. That's how it feels. And we tend to, as a result, underestimate, greatly underestimate the possibility and the impact of major disruptors. Because in our modern environment, of course, we face many more disruptors. One of the things that likely changed in the last five years was the influence of smartphones in your life, being always on, always connected. That is a big change for many people who did not used to have that. And the influence of social media has social media has become much more prevalent and powerful. So technology has become a major disruptor. And if you think, you know, 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis, major global disruptor, and now COVID-19, it's just as major, it's more of a disruptor than the 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis, because we have a fiscal crisis combined with a major health emergency, and the health emergency is ongoing, creating more fiscal problems that people are not nearly paying enough attention to. I mean, this is so serious and we really don't understand the kind of impact that COVID-19 will have because again people are even if they're planning they're planning for the most optimistic scenario of end of 2021 and that is a very bad idea hope is not a strategy so that is not something we should be doing and people don't realize that and here we turn to another cognitive bias called the planning fallacy when we make a plan we feel like the plan will come true that's how it feels. We assume that the future will go according to our plan. That is very intuitive for us. And that leads us to not prepare for a lot of problems, for a lot of risks that we don't anticipate happening, like COVID-19. You know, Bill Gates and other prominent people were warning us about a pandemic, but how many people actually bought pandemic insurance, which is something that was available, not available anymore, but it was certainly available for companies to buy. And that's some, certainly something that could have been bought by a number of companies, but very few chose to get that. And of course, they would be much, much better off right now if they had gotten pandemic insurance in a timely manner. So we had to estimate the needed resources and don't protect ourselves as much as we should with pandemic insurance and so on. 
of time, money, information, social capital, strategic planning efforts that we really should to address this. And we don't pivot in a nearly timely enough manner when our plans become disrupted by COVID-19, especially since so many companies right now are treating it as a day-to-day -day issue instead of the really strategic major long-term impact that they need to be treating it as. And finally, hyperbolic discount. This is another major issue with COVID-19. We perceive the short-term future as more important than the long-term. That's just how it feels. In the Savannah environment, it was important to be very short-term oriented because we couldn't really save resources for the future. We killed a mammoth. You know, we needed to eat all the meat we can in the short term right now as much as possible, stuff our bellies, because soon enough the meat will rot. We couldn't preserve it. In the modern environment, of course, we have the fridge, but you know, hopefully we're not going mammoth hunting. But you we have banks, you can store your money in a bank, you can develop your professional career, invest in yourself, learn a lot of things. I mean, the Savannah environment, what are you going to do, become a better axe chipper or something? <laughs> not something that's going to be very helpful. In the current environment, you can invest in yourself in the long term and make yourself much more capable in the future and your company. You can invest in your company in the long term and make the company much better off in the future. So we tend to prioritize the short term at the expense of the long term, not think about the long term impacts of major disruptors like COVID-19 and not plan enough and address enough resources to deal with the long term. So those are the three cognitive biases that are the most big, the biggest problems in, when dealing with COVID-19. In order to overcome these dangerous judgment errors, you need to go against your intuitions, not go with what you feel, not go with what's comfortable, not go with what feels right. Because that's the definition of going with your gut, going with what feels right. Our gut will lie to us very often in situations that are not like the Savannah environment, major long-term disruptors like COVID-19 and so many other cases planning that have to do with normalcy bias, planning fallacy, hyperbolic discounting. Our intuitions were great for helping humans survive early onward, but not in today's world. So think about, for example, donuts, right? It's delicious. It feels nice to have a donut. But, you know, when you have a box of dozen donuts that somebody left in the break room, it's very tempting to have more than one donut. And you really should not be having more than one donut. They are very rich in calories, fat, other things that we should be not eating. But once you start eating those donuts, it's very, very, very hard to stop. Or let's say when you there's a half gallon of ice cream, right? So ice cream comes in half gallon packs, and it says that a serving is half a cup. <laughs> you show me the person who can have half a cup of ice cream. I, I don't know this. I have not met a person yet who can have a, have a cup of ice cream when they have a half, pack, half gallon packs in front of them. So that's not something that we can easily do. That is because in the Savannah environment, when we came across a source of sugar, we need to have as much of it as possible. We needed to eat all the sugar that we could right then and there and stuff our bellies. When we came across honey, bananas, apples, we are, are the descendants of those who ate all the sugar that they could who had a very strong fight or flight reflex. Those are the people who survived and thrived. And we still feel like doing that in the modern environment because we're the descendants of these people. Instead, what we should be doing, of course, is having sugar. It's not having sugar, it's turning to a more healthy form of snack. You know, having peaches instead of donuts. When you start having peaches, you're not nearly as turned on by the sugar in the processed donuts. And so you can manage yourself much better and not have uh, all the peaches and you know, that's not something that people typically do. You know, have all the peaches that are in a bowl of peaches, versus having more donuts than they should is something of a problem. So you have probably developed a lot of healthy habits, like choosing to buy peaches instead of choosing to buy donuts when you have that choice, and hopefully eating peaches, sliced fruit when you have that in a diner or something like that, than having donuts. And this is very important for us to understand that that's the same kind of things. It's hard, it's difficult to do that. And that's how you go against your intuitions. And you need to do that in order to make good decisions about COVID-19. So you need to make long-term changes to your plans. Think years, not weeks. And for businesses, you need to prepare by making fundamental changes to your business model. And as project managers, you can help your businesses do that, your organizations do that. You wanna focus much more on virtual interactions than seems intuitive to you. Make a commitment to virtual teams and offerings as much as possible. I have to say just as much as possible, virtual teams and offerings. I strongly encourage you to end office space lease, sell office space. You know, a number of my clients have been able to move to all virtual offices and they've been quite fine. They've been surprisingly successful doing so. 
And that's one thing you can do. Or you can downsize to 10% of your current foot uh, foothold and just leave a couple, one person in the office, ideally, maybe two people. That will create a lot of safety for COVID-19. They can deal with paperwork that comes in and out, take care of things that they can't outside the office. And that's something they can do. So I strongly encourage you to think about these things and move to that as much as possible to virtual teams, virtual interactions. There are a number of things that you need to address when you move to virtual teams and interactions. Internal controls, major thing you need to address. Of course, one thing is financial security. Your financial security protocols, processes will be very different when they're done by virtually than when they're done in person. So you need to make sure that they happen effectively virtually and you need to address these interactions. And cybersecurity vulnerabilities relates to that and more broadly, that's something you need to address. There are lots of people, including people who are in senior leadership roles, who often are not very technology side. I mean, I had one of my clients had a C-suite officer who older officer, not very, not very technology savvy. When he came home, was working on his computer, tried to hook it up to his virtual computer at work. He had trouble with Microsoft, uh, with a firewall, Microsoft firewall. So he turned off his firewall to connect and uh, was able to connect, but of course left himself vulnerable to serious hacking. And the FBI is seeing a lot more hacking going on right now. People are not used to following the typical cybersecurity protocols at home, and their computers at home aren't hardened. They don't have the right software often. They don't have the right hardware to support their work. So that's something that you need to fund, that your organizations need to fund people with and give them training. Then you want to adapt your existing compliance practices, whatever you're doing for various compliance, you know, from sexual harassment to bullying to whatever of diversity, you need to adapt that to virtual settings. And then pursue compliance with CDC guidelines for the in-office interactions. You know, a number of my clients, like I mentioned, go all virtual. They still have some person-to-person -person meetings in co-working spaces, so they can do CDC guidelines there. Or if you downsize your office, you still need to do some, uh, adapt and comply to the CDC guidelines. And finally, revise your internal measurements. Your internal measurements of effectiveness and efficiency need to be revised for co-work, for a virtual environment. Next, motivation engagement. You know, before the pandemic already, it was hard to engage employees. Only 34% of all employees were fully engaged, which means they were, they were motivated, creative, problem solving. They were really inspired to help the company sacrifice for it. Most people, about 60% were passive. They just came in, touched the clock. They did the better minimum they need to do. And about 15% were actively hostile, badmouthing the company, looking for another job, ready to steal if they had the opportunity. Working from home creates more disengagement because you don't have the motivation that you get from being around other employees, that tribal sensibility. And there's also the stress of adjusting to all sorts of household issues with the pandemic. I mean, many schools are not going to reopen. Many summer camps aren't taking place right now. So people have children at home. Many schools will not reopen and their children will still be at home. And of course, some universities are closed. So teenagers will be at home who should have been in universities. Uh, not making a judgment on whether schools should or shouldn't reopen, but that's something that is going to be a major issue for people and many other issues that people have to do. So you need to provide support and guidance to your employees on these issues. That's support and guidance. Next is effective communication. People aren't used to communicating effectively virtually when they are immediately and quickly switching to from an in-person communication setting to virtual communication. They have to quickly adapt to a lot of Either, I mean, I hope it's not all email at your workplace, but they have to adapt to Slack, you know, Trello, Microsoft Teams, Mondays, whatever, Asana, other collaboration software, which is mainly text based. And you lose a lot when you move to text based communication. The written communication causes a lot of misunderstandings. You know, when I say something like, I think Mary should take that project versus I think Mary should take that project. Those two sentences mean very different things because of the emotional cues with the tonality. But when I write them down, they mean the same thing and they cause a lot of misunderstandings and problems. So here it's essential to train employees in these issues of virtual communication in, ver in teams. So that's something that you need to train them in. Next is problem solving. So problem solving is something that people don't think about as 
relevant to virtual con transition, but it's very important because in face-to-face -face interactions, it's easy, much easier to notice problems. You can see when someone's anxious, you can see when someone's upset, when someone's frustrated, when someone's confused, surprised. And you can address that in the moment. You can have a conversation around the water cooler in somebody's office, have a person-person interaction. So you can um, resolve these problems. But in a virtual team, it's much harder to do. You can These problems go unnoticed. And it's critically, really important to offer training in this area, especially because it's harder to resolve these problems with communication issues going on, like I mentioned. Next, cultivating trust. So cultivating trust is natural in office settings. You come, you talk in the water cooler in the break room about your kids, about what's going on for your vacation plans, about the local football team, you know, go Bucks here in Columbus, Ohio. It, it's easy to build those relationships, but it's much harder to build those relationships and cultivate trust in virtual settings. That's something deliberately you have to do. You have to create venues for doing so. And we can talk in the Q&A about how to do so. And finally, accountability. Now, accountability is really important in an office environment. It's natural to hold people accountable. As a supervisor, you can walk around and check in with people. As a project manager, you can check in with people who you're managing as part of the project. But what's going on? What's your step? What's your step? Who? What are you doing? But it's much harder to do so in virtual settings. You, know, you can't, if, even for peer-to-peer -peer accountability, you can't, if you, if you have a peer who, as a project manager, you require something from a peer. You can you pop into the, their office and say, hey, Bob, where's that report you're going to send me about the project? Well, guess what? It's much harder for Bob to ignore you when you're in his office door than when you're sending a message on Slack. So you need to create new structures to ensure accountability, both up the chain of command and peer-to-peer -peer accountability. We could talk in the Q&A about how to do so. Okay. That's the six areas of the internal business model. The external business model also has six areas that you need to change. Service delivery. So you need to change the way you deliver your services. This is really important, something that people don't think about nearly enough. So as you transition to virtual services, think about how to deliver your services virtually or at least socially distanced. Some will find easier than others. Others need to be much more creative. So for me, I had to, I mean, I had book tour lined up. I had a lot of speaking engagements, in-person consulting engagements that completely got canceled with COVID-19. So for me, I have to change my whole business model for my company, Disaster Avoidance Experts Consulting, Coaching, and Training to be all virtual in the context of COVID-19, pretty much all virtual. So there's still some in-person things I can do in my local area, but pretty much all virtual. And this is a big, big problem, of course, for me to transition to all virtual, but I'm working on it. This is an example of this webinar and my team is working on doing so. And we're starting to see business starting to tick back up as we are offering effective virtual services. I have to say, some people are not going to be in a good position to do so. So you want to think about in some businesses getting out of that business. I helped a COO of a chain of Midwestern diners leave her position because diners are going to be in a terrible position right now. I mean, you see a lot of places that have opened up where then diners rush to reopen for indoor seating, then they close their indoor seating. And some are, you know, bars, the same thing, right? Completely closed bars or closed the indoor seating. <laughs> Restaurants and bars have a notoriously low profit margin. They're not going to be doing well in the pandemic. This is a really bad area to be in. So if you can leave that area, it helped her transition to be to working in a senior executive position in a grocery store chain. So that is a much better position. Grocery stores will be doing well and there's a lot of room for potential for growth for her there. So that's the way you wanna be thinking about what's going to be doing well in the pandemic. Relationships. You need to learn and teach others how to cultivate relationships with external stakeholders effectively, both establishing new ones and existing ones. So all sorts of external stakeholders, whether clients, service providers, political leaders, which are increasingly important, of course, in the pandemic with the amount of money flowing out of Washington and some state capitals, your prospects, your investors, suppliers, and so on. Invest in professional development. There's professional development on virtual relationship cultivation. I strongly encourage you to do so. Managing disruptions. You want to understand that 
as a result of your external stakeholders not being as nearly as savvy as you, you're checking out this webinar. So you're going to be much more savvy about the reality of the situation, but your external stakeholders will not. So they won't plan for the long-term impact of the pandemic. And so you need to make plans to protect yourself from their failures to ensure that they don't rebound on you. Then shifting norms. Talked about how our norms will shift, you know, in a society, in our society, over this period of several years while we're dealing with the pandemic, we'll have such different restrictions and loosenings. We'll have different values, desires, norms, expectations, habits. You want to anticipate and get ahead of these shifts so that you're positioned well for the future and your company, your organization is positioned well for the future and you with your career. Then unknown unknowns. The pandemic was a kind of unknown unknown. Many people thought of it as, you know, oh, unknown unknown came out of nowhere, but a lot of people were warning about it, like Bill Gates and other prominent people. So it was a predictable disaster if you knew how to listen and scan the environment for other sorts of disasters, other sorts of problems that are coming up. So you want to scan your environment for major potential disasters, what's going on and how can it combine with the pandemic to be much more serious. There are a number of things that are combining, let's say, there are fires in you know, California. That's going to be an issue. In Michigan, there are some fires, and that's going to be an issue for evacuation because in shelters, it's going to be hard to socially distance people and, you, uh, and provide them with all the things that they need. So that's an example of how the pandemic can combine with other things to be a serious problem. You need to protect yourself against them by looking for them and planning your protection. But of course, not everything can be predicted. Some things are really random. So you want to make like a, let's say a solar for layer. So solar for layer can be really bad for, for example, energy production. If you, for, and, and so many other things It can put out satellites. It can be really an issue for a number of things. And that's not something that can be predicted against. So you want to maintain a cash, new cash cushion for protection. Finally, think about outcompeting your competition. As a trusted advisor to leaders, this will be especially important to convey. The steps I shared, if you follow them, your company follows them, they'll give you a major competitive advantage. Many will fail to adapt to the pandemic, they'll stumble. This is an opportunity for you to get ahead of them. So think about how you can seize market share, how your company can seize market share, and talk to the leaders about how you can do so and how you can hire away good employees. And finally, I want to talk about how to plan for the long-term impact of the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery. Think about, there are six areas. Think about possible futures first, so possible futures. There are a variety of futures possible. Just it depends on your sector, depends on your industry, what you're doing, what you're thinking about the future. But you want to plan for these futures and invest your resources accordingly. As a basic, as a baseline, you can think about the optimistic, the moderate, and the pessimistic scenarios that I outlined with getting out of the pandemic. Think about five years out. What will be the case for the variety of futures that you plan out? What will your business look like in these futures, in these five years? Think about each of these scenarios that you planned out. For example, the pandemic, the optimistic, the moderate, and the pessimistic. Then think about problems. What kind of problems can come to you in each of these scenarios? Each of, so think about ways that you can address them in advance. So if you are having, if you might have supply chain issues because your suppliers won't be doing very well in the pandemic, see if you can diversify your supply chain, maybe localize it. Make a plan to resolve issues if they do occur. Then opportunities. What kind of opportunities might arise in the pandemic? List them and in each scenario, think about bringing them about. So for example, my, a number of my clients are right now thinking about, hey, there are some prospects who I would like to work with who are working with my competitor. And they're B2B, so approaching these prospects. They're approaching these prospects and I'm having them approach these prospects. Their sales people are given training on how to approach these prospects and tell these prospects. But hey, Mr. Prospect, you know, we have done steps A through F to be pandemic proof. So we've really taken care of ourselves in the pandemic in case the pandemic is going to be a bigger issue strategically than many people think. And if our competitor happens to not have taken sufficient steps to prepare themselves well for the pandemic, we'll be happy to help you in their stead. So that's something that the Mr. Prospect will keep in mind and will keep your number in mind, your email in mind, whatever you're using in case the competitor stumbles or make a plan to seize them if they occur. So that will help you bring them about. Then others may, may come about. You wanna make a plan to seize them if they occur. Your resources, think about the resources available. 
for each of these scenarios. And then there will be a variety of resources that you need, money, time, information, strategic capital, social capital, strategic planning, and so on. And think about reserving these resources. Reserve enough for the moderate, and ideally the pessimistic scenario. And most companies can reserve enough for the pessimistic scenario. Some smaller companies can reserve only sufficient resources for the moderate scenario. Don't plan for the optimistic scenario. It's really unlikely to occur. You want to hope for the best. I mean, 75% of chance that it won't occur. So very unlikely to occur. Don't plan for it. Hope is not a strategy. You want to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. And then think about information. What information will indicate to you that you're in each of these worlds? So think about this information, monitor it closely, adjust your plans accordingly, and then execute, execute, execute. All right. So additional resources. There'll be an email from me from the about additional resources, free coaching session with me, and two chapters from my new book, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions at this stage. So please type your questions into the question box. You'll see uh, the Q&A, so happy to do that, or the chat box, either is fine. All right, let's take a look. So Linda asks, did you take into consideration the amount of people that get it and may be immune to it? Yes, so yes, I did take that into consideration. And that's part of why the optimistic scenario is the 25%. It assumes a high, high level of government competency in education about the, you know, in education about the coronavirus. And that is something that is, you know, something that we have to think about. 75% probability that it won't. Oh, Linda asks, have you seen, yeah, definitely. So disaster avoidance experts, I've seen a lot of people who are coming to me for training and adapting to COVID-19, adapting to this new abnormal. How do we deal with it? How do we strategically manage the situation? So yes, I've definitely seen uh, that increase. Yes, uh, so Linda says opportunities may exist to buy groceries directly from suppliers instead of from, yeah, definitely. So when you're protecting yourself when you're looking to protect yourself from an outbreak in the local area when something may happen, supply disruptions, I strongly encourage you to go to websites like nuts.com, beans.com and, and so on and buy wholesale, buy in bulk. You'll get a better price and you couldn't get you know, more groceries that way. So you'll be in a better position. All right, I'm looking to see if there are any more questions. Happy to take questions. You can put in the Q and A in the chat. Yeah, don't care. Whatever is most convenient for you. Anita asks, in planning for long-term strategy with major disruptions, what areas to look at for trending, like AI? So you want to look for things like AI, but you want to also understand that with COVID-19, there will be a lot of things that previously we were thinking about would be going on that are not going to be going on. So for example, energy use, oil prices are going to be quite a bit lower. Energy, there's going to be quite a bit less demand for energy. So that's going to be an example. So there are some things that are going to change the trends. I don't think there will be necessarily as much investment into AI because companies will be looking to husband their money. And of course, some companies will be investing into AI, but in some ways AI might be, even though some companies might not be investing into AI to, for further research and development, some areas AI may take off that's already existing. So for example, automated service in restaurants, that has been already going on in a number of areas where you can order yourself without having a waiter come to the table and where already food can be delivered to you automatically. And that may be going on much more. And so there's going to be, and of course, a lot of industrial applications of this too, where existing AI may be adopted more widely because of the need to address social distancing in factories and of social distancing in the restaurants is you know, one thing. Social distancing in factories is going to be a much bigger problem in many ways. And an agricultural processing, that's going to be a major issue. So that's something you, know, you want to be thinking about how to adapt existing technology. Helen asks, what industries will thrive in the COVID environment? I'll tell you some industries that will not necessarily thrive that you want to avoid immediately. In the moderate term, healthcare will not be 
as good as it seemed because a lot of elective surgeries are being delayed. And so a lot of hospitals actually are running out of money because of the delay in, hosp in this. And telehealth doesn't pay nearly as well as in-person visits. So there are many, many less tests. If you know how the health industry in America functions, it's based on the amount of procedures and many less procedures are being done right now. So that's a big issue for the health industry. So the health industry in the moderate term, next several years, while it looks good, while people think, oh, it should go up, it will not necessarily be doing very well. I think it will be doing well later as things take off and there are some changes, maybe especially people will be more conscious of their health, especially after COVID, they will be more willing to do various procedures, but that's not something you want to go into right now. So things that will do well, I mentioned grocery stores. So things that will do well, grocery stores, online delivery, various sorts of technology that facilitate. So technology will be doing well. Amazon and so on will be doing well. Google streaming services, things that facilitate people staying at home, home improvement will be doing well. Lowe's, you know, Home Depot, all that will be doing well. Finance industry will be doing mostly well. So people will still need to manage their finances, of course. You'll have bank, banks that are going to be in some trouble as foreclosures increase, and there's no question that they will increase as we go through a fiscal, uh, for, through a recession. So that's going to be a problem, and there will be a, 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 their economic problems, but finance industry is still going to be doing pretty okay. You'll see a lot, the legal industry will be doing pretty okay. There'll be a lot of lawsuits over COVID-19 issues. So that's something that you can bet will be doing pretty fine. So that those are areas that are going to be doing pretty well. And of real estate is not an area that will do that well, I, I have to say that because a lot of people are downsizing their offices. So that's an area that will not be doing well. Manufacturing, we still need manufacturing, but there will be a lot of investment into a number of things to do social distancing. So I'm not quite, you, if you go into manufacturing, you wanna be thinking about how to get ahead of those shifts and get training in those areas that will be developing, which will be things that enable my plans to be better at social distancing. So Jerry says, you're currently completing many aspects of work virtually, but this is really beneficial for the need for long-term planning, not only for managing projects, clients, but also office planning. Yes, absolutely. So you want to think about your internal team, your internal organization, not simply projects, but how to collaborate together effectively. And I'm glad that that's, that's helpful. All right, uh, let's see. What resources do you recommend to help train our teams to have good interpersonal relationships in a virtual environment? Great. So I can recommend a book. So you'll see in the chat, the person who asked about virtual teams, there's a book called Virtual holding face to face. It's a book uh, called Virtual Teams Holding the Center When You Can't Meet Face to Face. And another one. Another one that I just chatted is called Virtually Speaking, Communicating at a Distance. So those are the two books I would strongly recommend. And they've been specifically put out as, as part of, of dealing with COVID-19. So they integrate COVID-19 discussions around that for teamwork and for commu effective communication. So I would recommend those books as something you can check out for effective interpersonal communication and team collaboration. Okay. All right, any more questions? You can type in the chat and the Q&A. I'm comfortable with either. All right, I'll count down from five and then we'll wrap up. For time for any more questions, Type it before I count down. Five, four, 
three, two, one. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Look for an email from you with further resources, and I hope this has been helpful for you for managing the projects effectively. Excellent. Thank you. Two thumbs up. That was great. You're very welcome. Okay, Linda, shall we wrap up? Anything you want to do for housekeeping for wrapping up? Nope, we're all good. So I'm all right. Up and we can go. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.